So yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about a portion of the deep sea, basically the water column between the surface and the sea floor. And I am going to talk about fisheries, but I'm also going to talk about mining because I think these two sectors actually intersect in, in ways that we're still trying to understand, but are really important for management perspectives. Okay, so the midwater ecosystem is basically all the white space on this diagram. So this is a cross section starting over here on the left of an island or a continent. Uh, moving on to the reefs and down the island flank or continental slope out onto the abyssal plain. And you can see depths are over here on the right hand side. And the surface waters are called the epipelagic. And this is where, this is probably the portion of the ocean that most people are familiar with, the, the surface couple hundred meters of the water. These are sunlit and this is where um, phytoplankton are, are photosynthesizing. But below that, starting at a depth of about 200 meters, there isn't any longer enough sunlight for phytoplankton to grow. And we enter the mesopelagic, or it's sometimes called the twilight zone because it's dimly lit. And this is a fascinating zone. And as one of the speakers yesterday introduced to you, a lot of the organisms in this zone, they live here during the day. When, it's, when, the, when the sun is up and when predators such as tunas and other things are foraging, they're hiding out from those predators. And then at night, they migrate up to the surface to take advantage of the high plankton uh, biomass, the, the mass of life in those surface waters for feeding. In the bathypelagic, which is when you get below roughly about a thousand meters, this is called the midnight zone. So now we, there isn't enough there isn't enough sunlight to see anymore, even for these uh, amazing deep sea animals. Uh, and it has a really poorly characterized fauna. We don't know much very, very much about this zone at all. We know it's connected to the mesopelagic and to the seafloor, depending on the depth of the bottom in the area. And then when you get below about 3000 meters, you've got the abysopelagic environment. And honestly, we don't even know if this is a distinct zone from the babypelagic because there's not really enough sampling for us to know this. What I can tell you with some certainty is that when you get within, when you approach the seafloor, within maybe 100 meters or so, you start finding more water column animals, jellies, small fishes, things like that. And that's probably because all of the dead plankton from surface waters is settling on the seafloor. And some of it might get kicked back up in the water column from time to time, and there's interactions with that bottom. So there's a, there's a little bit more life right near the seafloor. So what are the animals that live there? This is a wonderful video showing a host of mesopelagic and bathypelagic jellies. That's a pelagic sea cucumber, krill, amazing squids, uh, fishes with large fangs and lighted lures, all sorts of, of amazing creatures. That's a lantern fish. This here is a lancet fish. Um, that's about a, that's a very large uh, fish, a little over a meter long. So these, the water column includes just a wondrous diversity of, of life. So a couple of key points when we're thinking about this water column system. First of all, the epipelagic is pretty well known. So this figure here on the right, it's kind of like the last diagram that I showed you. And the colors indicate how many animal records we have from these different depths. And the reds have a lot of records, and it's actually on a log scale. So it means that the yellows are actually several tens less uh, numbers of observations than the reds, and the blues about 100 times less than, than the yellows. And so you see in the near shore, on the reefs, and in, in the coastal environments, we have a lot of information. And you can see this red stripe across the surface of the ocean. And we, we know quite a bit about the skin of the ocean. As you move into the mesopelagic, we still know a fair bit. And as you move into the bathypelagic, we know far, far less. That really becomes kind of a black box. We also know that in the water column, communities are moving with the flow of the water. And this sometimes is hard for us as humans to get adjusted to, to think about, because we live on a surface. We live on land. And that's kind of a two-dimensional surface. And even when we think about the seafloor, the seafloor itself is, is a surface, but in the water column, uh, you have fully three dimensions and that water is moving and carrying organisms about, particularly the plankton. Uh, 
and this can lead to well mixed populations. The map on the bottom is the distributions in the mesopelagic and each swatch of color represents a portion of the ocean where if you were to take a sample of the animals that live there, any two places within one of these colored swatches, you'd find a lot of the same animals. So we now are finding also that that's it, not everything is the same in these colored swatches. If you go to an underwater mountain, you may find different pelagic animals that aren't found anywhere else in one of those colored swatches. Uh, and that eddies and some of the currents within these areas can actually lead to some differences. But generally, we have pretty well mixed populations in the water column. Another important characteristic is that the pelagic food webs are connected vertically. So we have these phytoplankton on the left all the way up to the top predators on the right, like this marlin or these tunas. And that surface food web, I think many of us are probably familiar with, uh, is certainly present where you've got plankton being fed on by a flying fish and on up to, to this marlin. But there are those animals that live deeper in the water column. And many of those animals are meso and bathypelagic and they vertically migrate, indicated by these arrows here. So again, during the day, they're deep. They're hiding from all the predators on the right-hand side of this diagram. And then at night, when it gets dark and they can't be seen anymore, they come up to the surface to feed. So this has a couple of important uh, consequences. First, the fact that these animals are moving up and down in the water column pumps carbon down into the deep sea. Animals that feed in surface waters and then go to depth and poop are rapidly carrying carbon. This brings it out of the upper ocean and the atmosphere and can help ameliorate the effects of global warming. Uh, it is not permanently sequestered unless it's all buried all the way in the mud, but, but this can help uh, over 100 year, 1000 year timescales. And also really importantly, as you can see here, we've got a lot of top predators and they feed on these animals. Two big eye tuna dive to 600 meters swordfish dive to over a thousand meters. And even some of the animals that live on the seafloor, like this deep snapper here, we call it onaga in, in Hawaii, and, uh, but it's found throughout the Pacific, uh, and orange roughy. These animals uh, live on the bottom and they eat mesopelagic animals that migrate past them during, uh, during their day-night excursions. So in fact, a lot of these deep mesopelagic and badly pelagic fauna are food supply for our seafood supply. So, as you can probably man imagine by this point, the, the mesopelagic, these deep midwaters overall, um, not just this mesopelagic zone, they're critically important to the functioning of, of life on the planet. They represent 90% of the livable volume on our planet. It's huge. They contain a fish biomass that has now been estimated at 100 times the global annual fish catch. Because the place is so big, there's really a vast amount of life there. And they, as you saw in the last diagram, they vertically connect shallow and deep ecosystems all the way down to the seafloor. They play key roles in exporting carbon out of the atmosphere. And some of that material that's exported into the deep decays, and that regenerates nutrients that stimulates more plankton growth in surface waters. Uh, the deep midwaters provide food to the things we like to eat. And they really have a, a pretty wondrous biodiversity. There's a lot of bizarre life forms and, and wonderfully unique life forms that live in these deep midwaters. So how does that all relate to fisheries? Well, believe it or not, there's actually interest in harvesting some of these animals. I, some of you probably know this, uh, many of you may not. The fishes you can see on the left are called light fishes. They are the most abundant vertebrates on the planet. There are trillions of these. They are very small, typically only a couple centimeters long. On the right is a lantern fish. Lots and lots of species of lantern fishes. Again, they're usually quite small, uh, maybe five to 10 centimeters in length. And there uh, has been an interest in harvesting those with big trawls in the mesopelagic. The reason, if you look at this figure on the right, this is from the Food and Agriculture Organization. And the, this goes from 1950 up to 2015. And it's the millions of metric tons of wild harvest of fish. 
And you can see since we're about where my cursor is, the 1990s, that that catch plateaus. What actually expands in terms of our seafood supply is this blue area, that's aquaculture. To feed aquaculture, we need fish meal. Uh, and so the fishery for these mesopelagic taxa is really targeting all these little fish to dry them up into fish meal and fish oil to fuel this growing aquaculture sector. So Norway, Pakistan, and others are now issuing mesopelagic fishing licenses. It's largely on a trial basis right now. And there are some serious concerns as to whether this is really sustainable or not. You are, after all, harvesting the food supply for other commercially harvested species. Uh, it is a trawl fishery, and uh, there's a lot of bycatch, sometimes of actual target species, uh, mackerels and some other things. Uh, but for the other smaller things, they'll all get ground up to fish meal too. So to my knowledge, there is no uh, interest right now in the sort of the Pacific Islands region in terms of mesopelagic fisheries. And some of you guys can correct me if, if you uh, have more recent information, but this has been focused right now uh, in the Indian Ocean and in the North uh, Atlantic. But it's something to keep your eye on. But there are lots of other important Pacific Island fisheries, of course, and interestingly, some of those are connected to the mesopelagic. So deep water bottom fish fisheries uh, occur all throughout, uh, and they are operating from about 100 to 500 meters depth and typically target this group of deep water snappers like this one pictured here from Fiji and uh, a couple of groupers and a few other species. These fisheries are generally commercial. Some of them are uh, for subsistence and they're conducted with small boats and typically hand lines, sometimes electric reels. But interestingly, a lot of these deep water bottom fish eat mesopelagic species. When they migrate up toward surface waters at night, they're intercepted by these deep water bottom fish and consumed. Then we have tuna and open ocean species. So in addition, things like that marlin I'm showing you there. And um, they uh, are commercially harvested. It turns out that a lot of the tuna fishing in the Pacific Islands region is actually by foreign boats from China, Taiwan, Belize, et cetera. Uh, they've purchased rights to fish within uh, countries' EEZs. They're often longliners and purse saners, uh, and they're fishing from the surface to about 400 meters. The, the interesting part about this, as I've already mentioned, is that a number of these open ocean species dive to depth uh, and forage on mesopelagic prey. And then we have some truly deep sea fish. They're typically associated with seamounts such as orange ruffy and alfonsinos. And those are found from 500 to 1500 meters depths uh, living on the seafloor. They are typically commercially fished because they need larger trawlers and long liners for their harvest. Uh, and again, these are kind of truly deep sea fish. And they have very slow growth rates, low reproductive rates. A lot of them eat mesopelagic prey. And uh, some, quite a few commercial fisheries have developed for these, particularly off of New Zealand, Australia, Hawaii. Um, they can have, because they're, a lot of the fishing is with trawlers, they can have devastating seafloor impacts. The top picture here is a seamount, uh, I believe off of Tasmania that has not been fished. And below it is a picture of a seamount that has been fished with trawls. And so on the top, you can see the coral growth and these wonderful orange uh, sea stars. And on the bottom, it's pretty much a, a, a sands bottom that's been stripped of all of these corals and other organisms. You do see a few orange ruffy there. So uh, the most of these seamount fisheries have really not been sustainable except at only very, very small harvest levels. So if we take a look at these Pacific Island fisheries in terms of the volume harvested, this is from a report put together by the FAO and, and the Secretariat of the Pacific Community. And it shows uh, a division of the fisheries into four broad groups. And the colored bars are different years. So we've got 1999, 2007, 2014. Coastal commercial and coastal subsistence includes a lot of the reef fisheries, which I haven't spoken much about, but it also, which are very important, 
uh, but it also includes those deep bottom fish. And you can see that coastal subsistence fishing is actually about twice the coastal commercial fishing in terms of total pounds or tons landed. But both of these are quite a bit smaller than the offshore fisheries. This would include mostly the tuna fisheries, although there would be seamount fishing in this category as well. Although in these years, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of it in these, in these figures. It's mostly uh, the, the tunas. And you can see that the offshore locally based fishing uh, is quite a bit compared to the coastal. The offshore foreign though dominates. It is typically twice of all, all the other fisheries combined. Um, it is a, a massive amount of, of fishing overall for this region. If we take a look at this in terms of dollar values, the coastal two categories are about, in 2014, their value was about 200 million per year across all the, the Pacific Islands. Uh, the offshore local was about $720 million. And the offshore foreign, and the, these, are, these are values of the fish landed at port. This is the sale value. The offshore foreign was about 2.2 billion. So it was massive. Um, the distinction there with the offshore foreign is that the income to the Pacific Island countries would be from issuing the licenses. And so I'm sure it's considerably less than that 2.2 uh, billion. And of course, we need to keep in mind that uh, fish is not just about tons produced or values in dollars, but there are considerable cultural values associated with fishing and, and conducting fishing, and those values uh, vary across these different, different fisheries and these, these different uh, um, methods and, and uh, island nations. And those, those are important to keep in mind. So a take home message here, for you all is that the next time you're sitting down to dinner and you're eating uh, a, you know, some poke or you, you've got some nice fish on the you know, deep water bottom fish on the table, you're actually only one step in the food web removed from some of these crazy mesopelagic creatures like viper fish and lantern fish and, and angler fishes. You're, you're not that far away from these things. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and move away from the mesopelagic and fishing and move into the water column, the mesopelagic and deep sea mining. Hey, Jeff, Diva. Jeff, do be cognizant of the time. Okay, I don't know. Uh, yep, we're I got about uh, six more minutes. Is that okay. going to be okay? Okay. Okay. So, Diva already provided a wonderful introduction to deep sea mining and uh, uh, this is a, a picture showing all the life that's going to be in the water over which these mining operations will occur. And one of the important things to note is that these mining operations are going to create noise which will be generated throughout the water column. These riser pipes which carry ore, that those are going to be quite noisy. And when they separate the ore from the mud and the seawater, uh, it's going to be discharged back into the water column. And we don't know where. A couple of companies have suggested they'll discharge it at approximately 1,000 meters. Uh, another company that I'm aware of says they'll discharge it back down on the seafloor. This is for manganese nodule mining. So the volume of that mud is going to be something on the order of 50,000 cubic meters a day. For reference, a shipping container, a 20-foot shipping container, is 50 cubic meters. So that's a lot of muddy seawater. And there will also be uh, chemicals, dissolved metals, from the breakup of the ore that are, that are disposed in, in, in the water column. What, we don't really know the scale of these effects. We have some models and they suggest that the plumes will extend for somewhere between 10 to 100 kilometers from where they're discharged. So that has all kinds of effects on midwater communities. The noise may scare away marine mammals. The mud may clog the gills of fishes. There are these marvelous filter feeders that eat little bits of organic matter that rain down from the surface waters, like this larvation that you can see in this video. They make these marvelous mucus houses here to, to filter the water, and they're going to get clogged with mud. They're going to have to filter through these mud particles to get the actual bits of plankton that they're looking for. Um, there may be buoyancy issues for jellies with mud settling on them, and the metals that are dissolved in the water column are likely to be toxic. And this is just a figure for toxicity of a deep sea benthic animal 
but we don't have any similar data for the animals that live in the water. And there may be a reduction in visual communication. Like I mentioned, the mesopelagic is the twilight zone, and we have fishes like the spook fish with this incredible clear dome for a head and big yellow eyes. It just illustrates how vision is so important. They also use lights. This is a dragonfish. You're looking at the bottom of an aquarium of a specimen captured on a ship, and you can see the lights under its eyes, its fins, its body, and they use these lights to communicate to capture prey, to attract mates, and so muddy seawater may reduce reproduction and prey capture capabilities. So all of those individual effects may integrate to changes at the level of a whole population. You add up all those effects on individuals. So community composition could change. There are going to be winners and losers. Animal or populations may emigrate. They may suffer mortality, decrease fitness and reproduction, and those may affect fisheries. So I want to bring this back around to where I started. So if we take a look at the fisheries effects, there may be alteration of migration routes and distributions. So tunas and other animals may simply avoid areas where mining operations are occurring. Some species that live on seamounts or your deep water bottom fish, which really are more attached to a particular location on the seafloor, may not be able to move as much there's probably going to be effects in the mesopelagic and that could reduce the food supply to these harvested species. And something that I'm concerned about is that there may be contamination of the food supplies in the water column and hence our seafood supply. This figure here is from work we did uh, in the North Pacific. We looked at the mercury content in a whole lot of pelagic fishes, which is on this y-axis, and shallow living things like this mahi-mahi here on the left doesn't have a whole lot of mercury in its tissues. This is naturally occurring. But if you look at the deep divers like a swordfish, they have 10 times as much. This is a log plot here. So we know that mercury naturally enters the midwater food webs or the food webs in the ocean through the midwaters. So if we pump a lot of other metals into this system, it's not unreasonable to think that some of those metals may enter those food webs and make their way up to our seafood supply. So just to summarize, um, the mesopelagic realm hosts a real incredible diversity and abundance of life and provides us with a number of important ecosystem services. Uh, Pacific Island fisheries do include some deep sea fishes like those on seamounts, but I think it's important to realize that a lot of other species are dependent upon food from the deep. Deep sea mining is probably going to cause harm to the mesopelagic, but we don't really know the scale of those effects and what they will be. And those could come back to affect fisheries. And then just finally, the point to leave you with is that sound management of our resources, I think really benefits from having a good knowledge of the connections that we have as a society uh, to the deep ocean, including, including the mesopelagic. And with that, I just uh, really want to thank Lisa and Dosi and everybody organizing this for inviting me and for all of your attention. Thanks.